Hello, my name is Peter and I work as a PHP team leader in Gdańsk. I work in a company which is responsible for releasing school books for, uh, for kids, for students, for teachers. And uh, our primary work cycle is dependent on the school year, which in Poland it starts on the September the 1st, every year. It ends uh, almost with the end of June. And the September the 1st is the time when we get a bit nervous. It's like a moment of truth for the whole team, for the whole company. And we always uh, want to make sure that everything works fine. But actually, before the date, before September the 1st, uh, there are already many different actions, like marketing, promotion, sales. You know, the whole company is preparing for this um, magic uh, date. And of course, we want to sell as many books, as many different products as possible. Um, and in, in our, our company, there are many applications which depend on date and time processing. Uh, but I'm sure that probably all of you have something in, in common with, with date and time processing because there are really many different applications. Um, even with this conference, when I submitted a proposal for this talk, I had to do it before some date, which was, I think, the last date of July. Um, later, I saw the source code for the Open CFP project, which is interesting, and uh, I encourage you to, to take a look at it. Um, there is one conditional statement because the business requirements were very easy. There was just one date, one term. But uh, there are many, many complicated systems where you have many different date and time constraints. And things might get a bit, uh, a bit weird. This is a direct inspiration for this talk. We had a code similar to this in our company's code base, and I had to modify it. Uh, a new business requirement requirements uh, came to us. So, what's wrong with this code? Well, there are a lot of things wrong in this in this one. Well, first of all, this code is hard to read. Like Sebastian said on Friday, the code shouldn't be cryptic. It should uh, be clear what the intentions are. Uh, here we have three Unix timestamps, which are easy to parse by the computer, but it's not easy to read by, by humans. And uh, the real problem that I was, uh, I was nervous with it is uh, when anybody from the business wanted to change those dates, they had to approach me and uh, say, oh, Peter, can you change the date, you know, move it two days forward? And I had to jump into the code, uh, make another commit in Git, and uh, push a new code to, to the production. Uh, but when it comes to the code that has to function under some date and time constraints, especially in the future, how do we make sure it will eventually work? Well, in this example, we have a variable that we cannot control, and it is the system time. Well, we can control the system time, but I think it's not a good idea to change the system time on the test server. And somebody asked, asked me this at work, Peter, can you change the server time so we can uh, test the, the form? No, it's not a good idea. So we cannot write a test for, for this code. And if we can't have a test for it, well, the refactoring is impossible as well. Uh, another problem which often happens in, in my company, well, this code is not reusable. This is actually a very important part of the business logic, of the domain logic. Uh, and probably there is a high probability that it would be used somewhere else in some other modules, some other projects, and what could we do? 
Is it a copy and paste thing? Something like that. But be before we start uh, rewriting that bad code, let's see what the PHP standard library offers to us. Uh, how many of you are familiar with C and C++ programming? Some of you. I can raise my hand as well. Uh, so uh, PHP has many different elements in its standard library. Some of them are derived from the C and C++ library. They are similar. But in PHP 5, we had this object model improved a lot. So uh, now we have some nice classes we could operate on. Well, the basic way to, to operate on date and time is to use the Unix timestamps, which is, I'm sure you already know that, but just to, to recall some things, this is a signed integer, which is a number of seconds since the epoch is the year 1970, January the 1st. And this integer value has no information about the time zone. So when you get that value from somewhere, you have to make sure what was the time zone set on that computer. Another problem is the year 2038, which comes from the, the problem that the integer is 32 bit. It has some limited range, but as I checked recently, on 64-bit systems, PHP 7 has no problems with, with that. As you, and as you can see, this example, the dates uh, before 1970 are, are negative numbers. And on the other hand, the year 2049 seems to work well. But why use some old functions from C or C++ if we have we have classes who if we could do it in an object-oriented way. These two functions do exactly the same thing. They receive some, some date and time, they add one month to it, and they print uh, the new date and time in the RSS uh, format. So to me, the, the second way is, is more clear, more readable. Uh, this is very important if you don't want to fall into some trap. Uh, there's a subtle yet very important difference between the two classes, date time and date time immutable. Um, when you first read that piece of code on the top, you think it's okay. It should be okay, right? We want to have two date and time values. The first one is now. And the variable next month should contain well, the next month, right? But we want, we still want to preserve that now value. But actually, the method add that you can see in the second line, it alters the now object and it returns, well, the same object. So actually, both variables, now and next month, they point to the same object, and we don't want that. So. I strongly, su strongly suggest using daytime immutable because it is actually a value object known from domain-driven design. And I think it's a lot more convenient and you can avoid some traps in your, in your code. But there are a lot more traps in date and time processing. Well, I'm lucky because my employer functions in, in just one country, in one time zone, which is Poland. We have only one time zone. So I'm lucky I don't have to deal much with the time zone thing. But if you develop applications in Canada, United States, Russia, all the whole world, well, things get complicated. For example, the daylight saving time is introduced during the year in different countries in different time. Time zones are not always shifted by whole hours. In Australia, you have eight hours and 45 offset. Well, I've heard one solution, which is to store all dates in coordinated universal time. And then if you have users in different time zones, you can convert them in uh, to different, to their local time. This is an example of Canada, it's a bit complicated. 
In Russia, it's even more complicated, more time zones. I saw this screen on another presentation on this conference, I think. Well, we don't want our applications to, to behave like that. Huh? Yeah. Well, but th there's more. Uh, sometimes we need to calculate uh, an interval between two dates. Um, so here, the method diff in the fourth line is actually creating a date interval object which holds the value of well, five months. But we can create the date interval objects on our own to make some more date and time calculations. This is the ISO 8601 syntax. Um, those two lines do the same thing. It's just a little bit different syntax, but they do the same. Uh, if you're not comfortable with this syntax, uh, the date interval class has public properties. You can uh, access them directly. Well, there are date periods as well. This example, we have a school year from 2017 to 2018. It starts on the September the 1st, and I'm using the coordinated universal time, time zone in this example, which is the letter Z at the end of, of the date. So this function prints all Mondays from this school year. So I have this, uh, I, first of all, I'm creating a date interval object from a named constructor. PHP actually knows some English language, which is convenient. Then we create this uh, date period object from one date to another, and then we can loop over, iterate over this object to have subsequent uh, dates. Well, we have MySQL at work, a lot of MySQL actually. Um, those three queries do exactly the same thing. They, um, they fetch the new stories from a specified month, like November 2017. But I checked those queries with the explain uh, statement. I created an index on the published at date, and actually only the last query were using the, the, the index in a proper way. Uh, so how do we get those values, the, the first day of the month and the last second of the, of the month? Well, I guess I, would, I could write a, some complicated SQL query, but I decided to do another thing to help myself with a bit of PHP. So as I said, PHP understands a bit of English language. So at the bottom, I get two values which are ready to be bound into an SQL query, into a statement. And this is the way I like doing it. But there is one problem with, with this code. Again, it depends on some external variable that I cannot control, which is you know, the current time. So I modified it a bit uh, in the constructor. I injected uh, well, some date. Maybe it could be right now, but to write a test, I can inject anything else. So I wrote a test which looks, which looks like this. And I'm checking two cases. The first one in the data set is some ordinary month, like November 2017. But I would like to check some, uh, some other Example like February in the leap year. The February 2016 has actually 29 days. Right? There could be a lot more problems in date and time processing. And if you're doing this, you have to be aware what is happening there. So we have the last day of January 2016. And we want to add one month to it. So what do we get? It's March the 2nd, because January has 31 days. If we had February 18th, for example, 
if you add one month to it, you want to get March 18, right? So actually, how many days are you adding in that case? Well, 29, because February has 29 days. Uh, for more examples like that, please refer to the PHP manual. Um, there is a very interesting presentation of one, unfortunately, it is in Polish by Michał Pipa. Well, maybe this guy could uh, do some English subtitles that would be useful. So let's go back to this ugly code that I had to deal with. I decided to rewrite it, but first I wrote a test, which is an, an example. It is a kind of small documentation of uh, the way I'm going to use the class that is not written yet. Um, we had some promotion which had a form on the web page, and that form had to change its behavior over time. Um, the first stage was, well, the form was inactive, then you had some date when it became active, the form could do some things, it was available, and then was some time when it was turned off again. Well, this example is very simple, but uh, after some time, business approached me once again and asked, Peter, can you add more dates, more stages in that form, so you get more and more variables? And I decided to call, to name this class a promotion timeline because it is actually responsible for telling me what is happening right now with the form. Is it active? Is it on stage some, I don't know, early bird tickets or last minute tickets or something like that? I want to make sure that my class, the promotion timeline, doesn't accept bad values, wrong values. Like, you know, the opening date should be always before the closing date. It's obvious, but we need to, to make sure nobody could uh, put wrong values in this one. And the actual implementation of, of the class is like that. Well, it's very simple, but like I said, business always have more and more ideas. They come up with ideas that we don't expect. And sooner or later, this class is going to grow. And then it won't fit into one presentation screen. A lot of things might come next from the business. Some early bird tickets, reminders, last minute tickets, coupons, Black Friday, stuff like that. Expect the unexpected. You know, uh, this year I traveled across different countries in Balkans. I really liked it, I recommend it. So I had to book some nights at different hotels. And, you know, different hotels have different policies about uh, the time that you should leave the room. Uh, some hotels want you to leave at 10 a.m., at 12 a.m. But fortunately, I am the premium user on one of the booking platforms, and I have extra time to sleep in the morning, so I love it. But if we were to develop such a platform, what would we do if our system has to behave in a different way, not only depending on date and time, but also depending on the type of, of user, the type of the hotel, probably, and stuff like that? Well, the old school way would be to do it like this. And it's simple, it works, it's sufficient, it's enough. But again, I expect this code to grow even more and grow in the future. So what are we going to do in such a case? I think we end up with more conditional statements, more if, 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 else, switch, case, thing, like that. And the code becomes harder and harder to maintain. And I've seen 
things like that a lot of times to grow in, uh, in the wrong way. So doing the, it the flexible way, I would create a class user which is not responsible for, directly responsible for calculating my checkout time at the hotel. Instead, it defers that calculation to some external strategy, strategy and that strategy can be, can be changed for different users. You can have as many strategies as your business wants. And all those strategies would have one thing in common, they implement the interface. It is simple, you have only one method in, in that interface, but again, it would grow in the future. So the standard strategy for ordinary users would be just like that. You know, ho the hotel wants you to leave at 12 a.m., so you have to. But if you are some kind of a premium VIP user or something like that, you might have some different calculations, right? So this is a class that receives uh, some checkout time defined by the hotel, but also it has a second argument, which is how many hours, probably, how many hours do we give to that, uh, to that user some extra time? Now, this, is can, this can be exchanged easily for different users. Well, maybe for some of you, this might look like an overkill in your projects. And maybe you're right. But first of all, let's discuss some uh, architecture topics. Well, the single responsibility principle has a lot of in common with uh, an observation uh, how many times different classes are modified for different reasons. Well, there should be actually one reason to, uh, to modify a class if it has just a single responsibility. If we would design a big bloated user class which executes some database queries, stores files on, on disk, stuff like that, then different people in your team would commit some changes to the same class. At the same time, maybe you would have some merge conflicts or something like that. We want to write a flexible software, right? And flexible means that we can easily exchange different parts of the, of the system. And high cohesion means that if you look at the classes, if you look at the interfaces, you know what to expect from them. You know you won't be surprised but, uh, by some hidden database or file system code in, in the user class, for example. And I keep saying this on and on because I witnessed it a lot of times. You never know what business brings next. So don't get surprised. But on the other hand, if you can just keep things simple, don't over-engineer. Like I said before, I'm lucky enough not to create systems that work in different time zones, different places uh, on Earth. But, but I know it could be a problem. Well, actually, a distributed system, I think it's a system with two servers on, or more. And often, you have an application server, a database, database server, and more and more. And for example, if you are executing some insert queries and you are logging the creation time, update time, some publication time, well, those dated times might come from different sources. I don't know if you are calculating that time in the PHP script or later on the data database server. You know, if there are slight differences between uh, this time, date and time values on this, these servers, you might have some trouble, right? Um, in, distributed system, in distributed systems where you would have a lot of different projects uh, using the same business logic, well, 
maybe you could think about sending some time events to them from one central agent. I don't know. I don't have personal experience with systems like that, but I'm trying to prepare for something like that. Well, I guess it would be a lot of, a lot of fun. Mm. I think that's enough from, from my side. Uh, if you want, if you have some questions, if you would like to, to talk about your problem, problems, then please do it. Please ask questions. If not now, you can approach me later on the dinner or something like that. I'm staying here uh, for the dinner. Or maybe you could write an email. You could visit my GitHub profile where I have some examples and I'm going to post more, more things like that. So, thank you. <laughs> Well, I'm available. If you want, just come talk to me.